Q&A. Up next on Lectures in History, Baylor University professor Thomas Kidd teaches a class on the First Great Awakening in the Americas, a period in the mid-18th century of Christian revitalization that swept through the colonies. He explains how the Salem witch trials and the decline of Puritanism led to an era of traveling preachers such as George Whitfield and an emphasis on evangelism. His class is about 70 minutes. We've been talking about the founding of the American colonies uh, and we're getting now into the into the 1700s. Uh, today and this week I want to focus mostly on uh, religion in uh, the late colonial period and uh, the coming of the Great Awakening in the 1730s and 40s and I know this has been on you all's minds since you have a paper coming up ab about that so we're going to give some of the background to religion in, in the colonial period and then uh, the lead up to the Great Awakening, some of the overview of what happens in the Great Awakening uh, and then hopefully that'll, that'll set you up better for uh, your, your papers. You can see here on the, on the screen we have an image of George Whitfield uh, who is the most famous preacher of the Great Awakening, uh, preaching in London uh, there in the 1730s, 1740s. Uh, he is the sensation of the age, but we'll, we'll talk more about him when we get there. First, I want to I take a look at the, the background to what's happening in, in 18th century America with regard to uh, religion. And we've talked about some of this already before in, in class about the scope of, of religion and religious commitment across the colonies. Um, if you look first at the, at the southern colonies from uh, Maryland down to Georgia, mostly what we have is a formal commitment to the Church of England. Um, and the, the, the Church of England, of course, is, is the national official church of England, of, of Britain. Um, and most of those colonies adopt a, what we would call a kind of formal establishment of the Church of England. Um, but the southern colonies overall are probably the least religious of all the colonial regions, which if you think about that for a second, you'll, you'll see why that's a little weird, because we think of the South today as the Bible Belt, correctly. But in the colonial period, it's different. Um, in the colonial period, there is a, a, a kind of formal establishment, at, at least, of the Church of England. But once you get out past the colonial cities, places like Williamsburg and Charleston and Savannah, the rates of church going and commitment to the Church of England is, is pretty limited. And part of the reason for that is you remember going back to the founding of Jamestown in 1607, these colonies are mostly being founded for business purposes. And it's a little difficult to set up churches um, in the back country where settlement is so scattered. And so people living in the rural south um, in the early 1700s, I mean, they might have been Christians for sure. I'm sure most of them would have considered themselves to be Christians. Um, if they were literate, they probably read the Bible. Uh, maybe they had family devotions. but. Uh, many, many of them did not go to church because maybe the nearest church is 50 miles away. And if that's the case, if you're going on a wagon, you're not going to go to church, right? So uh, the South and people in the North, in the Northern colonies recognize this. This isn't just looking back as a historian. People in New England would talk about their worry for the South and its relative godlessness. Um, that there just weren't that many people going to church there and there weren't enough churches, weren't enough pastors. And so the South was really regarded as, as the least religious part of the colonies. The middle colonies, and here we're talking about New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Delaware, is a, a real mix of different kinds of Christian denominations. Um, you have, and they're often connected to a particular um, ethnicity. So you have Scottish Presbyterians or Scots Irish Presbyterians. Um, you have Dutch Reformed people. These are, this is the group who founded New Netherlands in the 1620s, the Dutch Reformed Church. Um, German Lutherans. Um, there are Quakers, of course. We've seen that. We, there's different Baptist groups in the Middle Colonies. Um, and so the Middle Colonies. 
I think it's representative of the kind of diversity that you see in modern America, that there's just a lot of different kinds of religious groups, a lot of kinds of ethnicities. Um, sometimes they don't get along with each other, they're competing for adherence, but it's kind of hard to tell the one single linear story of the South and slavery, New England and Puritanism, the middle colonies is just more like, like that. Um, and in New England, when you get into the early 1700s, and when, you, when you're talking about the 18th century, we mean the 1700s, New England sees the decline of Puritanism. And remember, they, they had been founded, Massachusetts, Connecticut especially, these kind of colonies are founded as Puritan colonies. And Puritanism by the early 1700s is in decline. We're now 70, 80 years past the, the time of the founding. And the, the Puritan movement has started to fade away some. Now, historians debate about just how much Puritanism is really declining. Um, some of this may just be talk, um, because it, you know that, that uh, pastors especially, but lots of Christians will talk about, oh, you know, thing, we, our, our, our founders we're much more committed than we are. I don't know if you've ever heard that in, in a church service or something, but you know, it used to be so much better, but now we've fallen away. I mean, that, that's, that's a very common rhetorical move that you get in churches, and you started to see that in the New England churches too in the late 1600s, the early 1700s, and it even breeds a type of sermon uh, a characteristic kind of New England sermon that you get in this period that historians call the Jeremiads. The Jeremiads. Now, if, if you know your Bible well enough, you, you'll hear a name in, in that. That's from Jeremiah, um, who was a very gloomy kind of prophet. Um, and he was the sort of prophet that said to Israel, uh, you've fallen away from God, you need to straighten up or else judgment is coming. And that kind of sermon became very common in New England, too, starting in the, say, 1670s, 1680s, early 1700s. The pastors would say, you've fallen away from your first love. You've fallen away from that original mission of the founding Puritan generation of the 1630s. And you need to turn around, turn back to God, and renew your devotion to the Lord. Now, how reflective this is of actual reality on the ground. I mean, had the people really turned away from God? It's sort of hard to know how to measure that. Um, it's hard, obviously, to ju judge people's hearts. But there is some evidence that at least New England is becoming more diverse, not just exclusively Puritan. You may, may remember that we talked about it then in the 1690s, England started requiring uh, Massachusetts to tolerate other kinds of Protestants, and you, you, not just Puritans, but now you have to tolerate Quakers and Baptists and other kinds of Protestant groups. Um, there are some intriguing uh, pieces of evidence about rising, um, at least access to sort of immorality and so forth. In, six, in the 1680s, it looks like the Boston probably gets its first a brothel, um, you know, the characteristic of colonial cities in London and so forth at the time. Um, but, you know, Puritan Boston gets a brothel, you know, a house of prostitution. Um, this is horrifying to a lot of people. There occasionally are dancing classes being offered in Boston in this era. So, you know, I mean, there, and the Puritans were not keen on, on, on dancing, um, especially between unmarried couples. Uh, it, it, you know, so there's, there are actually some pieces of evidence that you could look at and say, well, maybe this is becoming a sort of more diverse, non-Puritan kind of society. And so, you know, maybe there is something there to that Jeremiah kind of, kind of theme. Probably the most horrific uh, episode for the pastors in New England in, in the uh, late 1600s, for sure, is the Salem witchcraft crisis. Um, and we, we read a, a document on this for today, if you want to pull your book out and, and, and look at that. Um, the Salem witchcraft crisis is, uh, is horrific for the leaders in, in New England, first and foremost for them because they see it as a great attack of Satan on their society. 
Um, the, the Puritans believed that they had this very high calling from God, and so they thought, well, of course, what would you expect that Satan is going to break out in these attacks against us? And that's how they saw what happened in 1692, is that Satan had raised up a cohort of witches to, to come in and, and attack their people and try to disrupt uh, New England society. And so that's how they first and foremost interpreted what was going on in Salem. And so um, dozens of people start being accused of being witches. It, probably if you, if you remember some of the story, even from maybe reading something like The Crucible by Arthur Miller, um, th there was a group of mostly teenage girls who probably had gotten involved in, in at least some kind of white magic type of, type of practice, um, trying to tell the future and so forth. And, and then those, those girls started to have uh, signs of, of what the Puritans would have considered to be sort of demonic attacks, demonic oppression, um, and having convulsions and, and, and being tormented. And they would say uh, that it was this woman, that woman who, were, who was coming, in, especially in, in the spirit realm, to attack them spiritually and to, to physically harm them. Um, and so ultimately, uh, now, by the way, it's, it's mostly uh, younger women accusing older women of being witches. So um, it, almost all the accused are women, but almost all the accusers are women too. And so one, one interesting um, historical investigation that some historians have engaged in is, what, was this a kind of, you know, what you would call misogynistic episode where a woman hating kind of you know, gender episode of, of uh, you know, loathing of, of women, especially these kind of older women who were you know, difficult to deal with, maybe had gotten into altercations with their neighbors and so forth. Um, and that's an interesting thesis, but, but one kind of problem with it is it's, is it's almost always uh, women, too, who are accusing. It would be a little more convenient if it was men accusing women to read it as an, a misogynistic uh, episode. But um, there are some men who get accused of, of being uh, warlocks, uh, and um, it, it ends up being uh, hundreds of people who get accused across the region. It's not just in Salem, but, but ultimately some very elite people start getting accused. And I think not coincidentally, that's when uh, the judges and other officials start thinking about closing the thing down because they can, they can see that the accusations have started to get, just go completely viral, haywire. And they said, wait, wait a minute, there's, there's, it's too many people uh, and they start to doubt some, uh, some aspects of the trials. Now, uh, everyone in Salem, in, in New England, I think approaching 100% of everybody, believes that witches exist. So even the critics of the trials um, are, are saying, well now, we know that witches exist, but there are problems that we have with the way that the trials are being run, okay? And, and we'll talk about why in a minute. But that's, that's a really important aspect to understand is this is not, um, you, you know, the Puritans who in their religious fervor uh, believe in the existence of witches and then standing outside of that, you know, you have these skeptics who say, you fools, don't you realize? No, everybody realizes or believes at the time that the supernatural is real and that it, at least in isolated cases that people can make a covenant with the devil in order to have malevolent spiritual power and so to be able to cast spells on people and maybe to torment them in, in the spirit realm at least. Okay, so let's, t let's take a look at this document and I'll get you to give me some comments uh, about this. Um, on, on page 43 in your book, you see we have uh, Tichaba, who they call an Indian woman. Now, it, it, it's debatable exactly who Tichaba was, but she seems to have been uh, maybe an indentured servant or a slave in the household of one of the pastors who's involved. And when they say Indian, um, we think that it might, might mean Native American, partly Native American, but it's more likely that she's probably from the Caribbean. Okay, so you remember when Columbus, he came, he says that this is the Indies. 
So um, sometimes when they said an Indian, that meant somebody from the Caribbean. Um, and so we don't, we don't know a whole lot about Tichaba other than these testimonies. Um, but she's being interrogated, and, uh, and they start off on page 44, and they say, the judge says to her, Tichaba, what evil spirit have you familiarity with? And she says, none. Why do you hurt these children? I do not hurt them. Who is it then? The devil, for all, all I know, and so on and so forth like this. Now, when you lead in like that, in this trial, what does that tell you about the way that judicial proceedings went in the 1600s? You want to bring the mic over? What does that tell you? Uh, it's very face value. There's no like evidence to back it up. It's just straight up asking and seeing if it happened. And yeah, I mean, it's very matter of fact, including yeah. about the spiritual dynamic. Yeah. Too. I mean, they're very willing to take testimony about what the devil is doing. What else does it tell you about judicial proceedings in the 1600s? Um, at least in this case, that there isn't much of an innocence until proven guilty. That's that right. uh, they're just a su they, they believe that she is guilty, but they don't necessarily have the evidence to back the claim. So. But they do believe she is guilty without a doubt. Yes. So there's no presumption of innocence. And that, and that is not unusual in the 1600s. I mean, in the English legal system at this time, there's no guarantee that you're going to be assumed to be innocent for sure. And so the way they interrogate these people is if you've been accused, you're assumed to be guilty. And so what they're really trying to do is to get her to admit that she's guilty. And you may have picked it up that she initially says, as we saw here, I didn't hurt them. But it's not too long into the interrogations that she goes ahead and admits that she is a wedge. Now, whether she is doing this because she wants to be let off, because it, it, it becomes clear that the people who won't admit that they're witches are the most likely to get executed. So you're in a kind of catch-22 here about, well, should I go ahead and admit it, even if you don't actually believe that you're a witch? But it could be that in some of these cases, maybe in Tichaba's case, some of these people may have actually been engaged in what they thought of as at least magical practices. Um, and, they, and there may be a few of them who actually did regard themselves as witches. So that makes it a real conundrum about how to run these things. I mean, because if you have people who consider themselves to be witches, you know, in a society where everybody believes in witches, then that becomes a law enforcement matter, doesn't it? Do you see what I mean? I mean, it, it's, it's tough for us to know, you know, in our kind of secular age, how do, how do you deal with these kind of, kind of issues, okay? Um, and so if you look on further... Uh, they said, well, what's this appearance you see? And she says, sometimes it's like a hog and sometimes it's like a great dog. Well, what did this, you know, animal being uh, say to you, they, they say. And she says, the black dog said, serve me. Okay? But I said, I am afraid. And he said, if I did not, he would do worse to me. Okay, now, who's the black dog? Who do you think the black dog is? Is it supposed to be Satan? I think so. I think, I, I, you know, maybe a demon, but, but probably the devil who's taken on this kind of animal uh, specter. Now, when she's testifying about this, and lots of people testified along these lines, either this animal spirit attacked me, talked to me, or at the bottom of the page, um, she's talking about, what else have you seen? Two rats, a red rat and a black rat. And then, do you see who it is that torments these children now? Yes, it's goody good, good wife good. Uh, she hurts them in her own shape. So she's come to them in the spirit, and she's tormenting them in the spirit realm, but it can have physical 
consequences. So what do you think is going on here when Tichaba testifies to seeing these things um, you know, sort of in the spirit realm? I mean, like, what, what do you think, does she believe this? What do you, what do you think? I mean, this, this is speculative on our part, so there's no wrong answer, but did you, did you have something? I, I don't think she actually believes in what they believe in. I think she's just manip manipulating them because she doesn't really want to be a slave anymore. Okay. Necessarily. So maybe telling them what she thinks they want to hear. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, I mean, it's bad news if you're goody good. Yeah. to get accused like this. So, you know, maybe there are people that they're trying to settle scores with. Um, do you think that uh, most of these accusations are people who are thinking consciously, I'm going to lie about the accusations? And again, this, this is, there's no right answer on this, so this is just speculative. Or do you think that there are people who are so deeply convinced that witchcraft and, I mean, this is a traditional Christian belief, at least in demons, right? I mean, like, demons are in the Bible, and, you know, I mean, so, remember their mentality, 1600s, it's a medieval mentality, in effect. So do you think that there are people who really do believe in these kind of things, or is it just a big sham? What do you, what do you think? Hold on just I think that there probably are some people who generally like do like believe in it, but I think the people who are like are being accused of it at that point in time, they probably don't go into it thinking like, yeah, I'm going to lie about this. But when they're put on the spot, they probably just get so desperate that they don't want to like get in trouble for something that didn't happen, like they, that they didn't do. They probably just end up pushing the blame on blame onto someone else. Yeah, and I think we can verify that. I mean, I, I think you're right, and and there are cases where late in the trials some people start recanting their testimony. And among the things that they say is, I was put under so much pressure. Um, and I think some of them would say, I even started kind of imagining that things were happening to me. But now that I think about it, I'm not sure I actually saw it. But, but some people definitely say they were put under so much psychological duress that they just went ahead and admitted to things that they, they knew weren't really true. And there are even a couple cases where we know that people were physically tortured, uh, which is they're also not supposed to be doing that in English law, that you're not, you're not supposed to extract confessions from people by torture. But, but a couple people were. And so, you know, one of the things with torture is you say whatever you think the people want you to say. But I think, I think it's true. I, th I think that, that there probably are some people, and it's hard to know exactly what their mentality is, you know, but that they, they think something is happening to them spiritually like this. And, of course, everybody involved um, pretty much believed that the devil was doing something in these trials.